please help me welcome to the stage director Mara Strauch and producer Eric Brueggemann. Uh, my uncle was a bass jumper and an aerial cinematographer, um, and I, I basically found a big box of footage, and I thought this footage was amazing. Um, I did not have a background in film, um, and I spent a really long time looking for the people who were in these films, and then asking them if I could have more footage. So it kind of snowballed and uh, became the film that it is now, but it was uh, quite a long process of kind of writing the story, which nobody had ever really done. I maybe was the first person that she showed it to. So we were looking at it together, being pretty fascinated by just the sort of clandestine world of base jumping and the sort of beautiful images of these sort of bodies falling through space. And uh, yeah, we sort of went on this journey and we didn't know exactly where it was leading, but it, it <laughs> seemed like uh, you know, it was a journey worth taking. So we dealt with uh, 70,000 feet of uh, 60 millimeter film. Um, and then we had a lot of VHS. How, how much that is? Sorry, how much uh, is that in minutes? Oh boy. Um, well, a thousand, like, um, yeah, it's about 35 hours. So it's not that much. I mean, by today's standards, you know, that's like not enough to shoot a documentary. I mean, we really. We loved working with not a lot of footage. We didn't have that much footage, but it had to be kind of hand cranked through and then transferred. So, you know, it was um, a very physical process of making the film, which is kind of unusual in the digital age, mm -hmm. I think. The interesting thing is it took about eight years, but, you know, we were both working full time. So we always say eight years, but it's like, well, what were you doing? Um, <laughs> working and then transferring little bits of footage and you know, than going back to work. I mean, we weren't kind of rich kid filmmakers, which, you know, is hard. I mean, it's hard to make, you know, documentaries and not kind of have enough money to do it and also support yourself while you're doing it. So, you know, that was a big challenge that we couldn't get through all the footage all at once. So people would be like, we want to see footage. And we'd be like, here's a little bit of footage and here's a little bit more. And, you know, then we'd raise money and in kind of these incremental steps. What was the process like of approaching Jean? to see if she would talk about her memories, because she's incredible what she shares. Yeah, I mean, you know, Eric and I had kind of reached out to a number of uh, base jumpers, <laughs> and I was filming a number of base jumpers, and I didn't really know what the story was about, so I filmed a lot of different base jumpers, and then I, I came across Jean's story, and I was just like, oh my god, like, that's incredible, and also there's these rows and rows and rows of 16 millimeter film, and she's like, yeah, it's kind of all disintegrating. And you're like, ah, you know, what do I do? <laughs> and it smells like vinegar and like, you know, all the audio is going. And you're like, holy crap, like, how, what do I do? This is like a sinking ship. And so um, she, you know, she was really wonderful. I mean, she really, uh, you know, she really wanted something to be done. And I think because I stuck around and I keep kind of showing up, um, she, she eventually kind of got used to me being there. And, uh, you know, it was, it was a s kind of a slow process in some ways, but, you know, I think, you know, she was a really good collaborator on the project, and, you know, it was a really good experience to kind of get to know her over that amount of time. Yeah, I mean, he, um, you know, he always had a saying that was, as long as I stay in hamburgers. So he was very frugal. He grew, he grew up in the house that he ended up um, having his studio in, which he inherited from his parents. Um, you know, he, he, he was super frugal, but he also shot commercials. So, you know, he shot the Gypsy Moths. He went on to shoot commercials. Um, uh, so he was selling footage, but he was also an aerial cinematographer uh, on a lot of films because nobody was really doing it uh, to the level and degree that Carl was at that time. So he had a pretty good career doing aerial cinematography. <laughs> no, I went uh, skydiving a few times. It's cool. I don't know. It's not for me, which is kind of weird. And it's like, oh, okay, well, why would you make a film about it? Well, I think documentarians often make films about things that they wouldn't necessarily do. So I, it was something that, you know, I kind of wanted to understand the why. And I definitely wanted to understand Gene Banish. And I definitely wanted to understand Carl Banish. So, you know, these were characters that I definitely wanted to kind of, you know, get inside their heads as much as I possibly could. I mean, Carl no longer being here. Getting inside his head was a little bit more of a challenge, but of course I wanted to find every possible clue I could and, you know, try to try to put something together that kind of, um, you know, uh, started to, to become 
you know, something where we could kind of start to understand the man of Carl Banish. We worked with this amazing uh, cinematographer named Peter Dagerfeld. Uh, he did The Girl with the Dragon Tattoo and like all these amazing movies, but he happened to be a base jumper. So he was like, you know, and he actually knew Carl. So it was this kind of crazy serendipitous thing where I was like, uh, would you shoot this for like not so much money? And you know, we got a lot of money from the Norwegian government, which was like kind of wild and um, which enabled us to shoot a lot there. And so we were bringing interview subjects over. We were, you know, shooting in Norway as much as we possibly could. And the reenactments for us were, you know, the, this chance where we could really shoot from the air and we could kind of have a point of view that we wouldn't necessarily have if we were just shooting from the mountaintop. Um, it was really exciting to get to, to shoot actors from a helicopter and the guys who were in the reenactments are all, all actually base jumpers and climbers. So it was really exciting to us to bring them on top of a mountain. They're like, ah, we don't need any, we don't need to be roped in. They're like, are you kidding me? And, you know, so they're like running down the mountain. So these are actually like, real kind of stunts these guys are doing and you're just like whoa okay but they they felt very comfortable doing this so it was an amazing experience to get to shoot this from a helicopter and you know direct the first things I've ever directed from a helicopter which was like <laughs> okay <laughs> so it was it was exciting um and and really fulfilling and um you know I think the cinematographers we had helped me out a lot um as a as a first time director so I think, you know, h hiring really good cinematographers can be very helpful. <laughs> she did this jump, and then she went on to run an uh, organization um, that's called Bridge Day, and it's in West Virginia, and they, they organize a jump that's kind of a legal jump every year, and Jean would organize this, and she also was on a lot of TV shows, and, you know, she did other jumps, so she, she continued jumping for a number of years. She kind of... You know, she was like, kind of like, no, nah, I don't really need to jump anymore. So now she flies airplanes. So she's really into flying airplanes. So she's, you know, she has her own things in her own life as she's getting older. And, you know, um, you know, she doesn't have the need to base jump, but she feels like it was a really important kind of part of her life. So she loves spending time with younger base jumpers and talking about what it's like to be a base jumper and you know it's cool it's super cool <laughs> what was it like obviously it's well selected but clearing those rights and having such an ambitious score in your film how did that work i've been calling e erica genius all day <laughs> yeah <this. laughs> it was mara identified all the songs and she's got great taste in music there were a couple times when she maybe had two or three tracks for a certain spot and she wasn't sure and i would say well no definitely this um but when it came time to clearing it it was just there is a real intensity about how it doesn't really matter how we're going to get these songs. <laughs> like, and I was just determined basically. Um, so went through the process. We decided not to hire a music supervisor because if we're asking to get these songs for very little money, why are you paying someone to do that for you? First of all. So I just, and we went, didn't have the money. So yeah. I mean, so really I, I decided we're going to go in with the very like naive sort of, uh, first time kind of dream shot kind of approach. And you're immediately met this with this very sort of jaded uh, machinery of the, of the music <laughs> industry. And most of the people were like, you know, I have an initial offer, which is a little lower than we could go, uh, a little lower, yeah, a little lower than what we could afford. We could afford a bit more, but it's still very low. And it was mostly like, you know, at a zero, you know, at least. <laughs> and I eventually just convinced people to like watch the film or at least watch the scene that the music was in, get the artist to look at it. And we eventually Carl really won them over. I think his footage really won people over, and we were really lucky to have that kind of card to play. Mm -hmm. you know? no, that's, that's true. <laughs> and yeah, we got every song we, we wanted except one. Wow. So. There's a couple times when he's recording his phone calls, and um, I really like just kind of his natural responses to people jumping, which was to get really excited uh, when other people were base jumping. And I think that spoke so much to who he was. He was all about kind of sharing the joy with other people. Yeah.